Thank you, JP. Good afternoon, uh, Judge Kuhn. Good afternoon, Chief Justice. How are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you, and I hope you and the commissioners are as well. Uh, we, we, we are trying. <laughs> um, for how many years have you been a judge? I was appointed on the 1st of November, 2006. So it's now 14 and a half years. I'll have 15 years at the end of this year. And uh, how many acting stints have you had at the Supreme Court of Appeal? I've had, um, what is it now, four, if I remember correctly. The first one was from the end of 2014 into 15. Then um, thereafter, I had from um, October 2019 for that session, the succeeding session, and the one thereafter, terminating on the 31st of May 2020. Uh, please, uh, um, uh, as briefly as you can, just brag and demonstrate to us how best suited you are to be appointed to the SEA. Well, um, <clears throat> I've endeavored to summarize that in the questionnaire, which I completed. But if I may just uh, speak about it briefly, um, I would like to think that I could make a very positive and constructive contribution arising from my experience over 14 and a half years in the KwaZulu Natal division of the High Court. Um, I have, apart from that experience, also prior experience at the sidebar. Um, after graduating, I was a part-time lecturer at the University of Natal, now the University of KwaZulu Natal, in the law of contract and also uh, civil procedure. Um, I thereafter, or after my graduation, um, did articles of clerkship. Um, I qualified as an attorney, as a notary public and a conveyancer in 1987 and practice as a professional assistant with a firm of attorneys until January 1988, when I went to the bar. So I have sidebar experience. I have the qualifications and experience also as a notary public and as a conveyancer in the property field. Um, I have experience as a junior advocate for 10 years from 1990, 1988, I beg your pardon, to um, November 1997, when I was uh, elevated to senior counsel status, and I practiced as a senior counsel until um, I was elevated to the bench on the 1st of November 2006. Um, I pride myself on the fact that I endeavor to deliver speedy justice. My judgments are normally complete. Um, within a couple of weeks. I think I've only had two judgments ever outstanding for more than three months. And in the one instance where that happened, it was in fact a very difficult matter. Um, it took me rewriting the judgment um, three times before I eventually ended up with a version that I thought was correct. I enjoy working as part of a team, which is obviously what I have some experience of, having been the senior presiding judge in full court appeals in the division which I sit, and then also being part of a team of judges, a panel of five, um, in the Supreme Court of Appeal context. Um, I've always endeavored to be independent, objective, and dispassionate. Um, I believe, particularly in the appeal court setting, that delivery of justice is a team effort. Um, the benefit of the Supreme Court of Appeal to me in particular lies in the fact that there are various um, or experience, disciplines and expertise of the members of the bench which are pooled and which by a 
proper process of discussion and exchange of views will hopefully result in the best possible um, judgment. Um, I have a background academically in the commercial field, having graduated with a BCom. I've also completed an, a certificate in arbitration from the Arbitration Foundation of South Africa. Um, I'm well equipped having um, majored in accounting to read financial statements, which I have found very useful in insolvency matters that I deal with, and also when dealing with the assessment of different business plans, which are submitted in proceedings where business rescue is at stake. Um, I've mentioned the fact that I was previously an attorney in strike off applications and the like. I'm well familiar with and feel myself equipped to assess the position of the conduct of attorneys who um, the particular legal practice council might be seeking to, uh, to have struck off the role or otherwise uh, punished. Um, yes, I, I think that possibly without laboring the other facts uh, are the contributions that I would like to make to the Supreme Court of Appeal should I be appointed to that bench. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Goon. Uh, before I hand over to you, President, may I have the list of colleagues who would want to, to put questions to Judge Goon, please? Mui Mang. Matolo Zeku. Dodovu. President? Thank you, Chief Justice. Good afternoon, Judge Kuhn. Good afternoon, Judge uh, Mandisa. Are you well? I'm very well, thank you. Good. Um, I won't keep you. I only have two issues that I'd like to raise with you. That you are inexperienced and competent judges is not in doubt at all, and you've proved yourself at the SCA. Uh, first is this, you, you know the, the demographics of the, of the Supreme Court of Appeal. It is a court under reconstruction in terms of gender and race representation. Out of a complement of 25 judges, we have only eight women. I won't do the breakdown in respect of the males, but we have four white, uh, we have three white males and one white female. Uh, you are one of five white males in this in 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 in, in this process we're busy with now, who I think it can be fairly said uh, is endowed as 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 you are. Now, what special attributes would you bring to the SCA if appointed that the other candidates, the other 10 candidates do not possess? I think the, the, the points that I've raised earlier are the attributes that I will be able to bring to the Supreme Court of Appeal. I appreciate, though, um, the point that you've raised with me. I'm well alive to the provisions of Section 174.2 of the Constitution, which requires that when there's an appointment of judicial officers, that the need for the judiciary to reflect broadly the racial and gender composition of South Africa must be considered when judicial officers are appointed. Um, obviously, I'm a white male. I can only refer to the contributions I mentioned earlier as contributions that I can make. The decision ultimately is, uh, is a difficult one, but it's one that you have left to make as this uh, esteemed body to consider, I would think, matters such as those contributions which I've referred to, which I believe I can make, weighed against the imperatives of section 174, subsection two, 
um, and taking into account, and this is something that I'm not necessarily privy to, but which you would be privy to, um, Justice Bandisa, Maya, I beg your pardon, because um, you no doubt have certain um, objectives in mind in deciding what you want on your court, who you want on your court, the experience that is required, and effectively what I suppose I'm referring to is some sort of a, a succession plan. So it's a, it's a multidisciplinary inquiry, I suppose, because you would have to look at how many judges you have who will still have, say, eight or 10 years left on the Supreme Court of Appeal bench where they can make a contribution and where they can establish a certain jurisprudential philosophy. You would have to look at who is retired, who will be retiring soon as part of that succession plan, and then weigh the, uh, the contributions which I said I can make, and I make them with, with due humility against the imperatives of Section 174.2 in deciding on uh, whether my application should be successful or not. I'm afraid if that sounds a little bit vague, I don't think I can be any more specific than that. I enjoyed the time that I worked on the Supreme Court of Appeal. I got on very well with the, with the various colleagues there, and um, I would very much like to, to continue and contribute to that court. Um, I'm fairly well poised, I believe, at the moment. I have nearly 15, well, 14 and a half years of experience on the high court bench. Um, Having been appointed at a fairly young age, um, I have an exit date from the judiciary in September 2029. So that means I have approximately still another eight and a half years left that I can uh, be a member of the Supreme Court of Appeal. I hope that will that answer answered your answer. Yeah. No, it does. And it, it's, it's not a vague answer at all. It's, it's actually useful. It's useful. The, the, the last uh, point is, is something you mentioned in your application form that you had um, heart surgery some years ago in, in, in 2010. If you not mentioned it, I, 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 would, I, would, I would never have known. Has that impacted your ability to, to execute your work in any way? No, not at all. Is it? Mm. No, as, as I mentioned, um, it was an unfortunate thing that it, it, it happened. Um, I had single bypass surgery, open heart surgery. I, uh, that was on the 1st of November, 2010. Um, I, was, uh, I was fortunate. I was very fit at the time, um, doing long distance running and, and other mm -hmm. sporting activities. I recovered fully from it. Um, obviously, I'm still I'm a member of the Zip Club, as they call it. Uh, I have a, a long cut in the front of my, my chest but I've recovered fully. I have no problems. I, uh, I'm not even on statin medications, which mm. some of you might know um, is uh, normally customary to be uh, prescribed to uh, patients formerly in that position um, to reduce their, their cholesterol count. Um, mm. I don't have a problem with that. I go for regular checkups at least once a year with uh, my cardiologist. And uh, every checkup since 2010 has come back completely clean. Um, it doesn't affect my workability. And in fact, end of 2019, I went and walked the, uh, the Camino um, from Portugal into Spain. Yes. Uh, without any problems. Um, yes, I, I lead an active life and it certainly has not uh, impacted on my health. Um, uh, in any in any way that would uh, affect my ability to work. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Judge Kun. That's all from me, CJ. Thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, Honorable Mueman. Thank you. Thank CJ, you. could you add me to please? I'm sorry. Sing. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Judge Kun. Good afternoon. Uh, just two two matters from uh, two questions from my side. 
the, the first one uh, relates to to the uh, <clears throat> the matter that you dealt with uh, that is reflected in your profile. Uh, the one that involved the Kiba Council and Judicial Resources Commission. Yes. <clears throat> the uh, thrust uh, that you made around the importance of of, 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 of compliance with the, with the Constitution when it entrusts uh, uh, a, a, a creature of, 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 of itself for that structure to function uh, efficiently and effectively. I would like to just to get a sense in terms of what uh, I drove uh, uh, the motivation behind uh, the judgment that, that you penned. The second one, the second one relates to to the uh, the the attack that uh, sometimes you 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 sense from from the public, uh, particularly around the uh, judgment that the court might make against either the executive or the legislature, whether it is the court condemning. Uh, uh, the government uh, allowing Al Bashir to to flee the country. <laughs> uh, what is it that can be done uh, to educate our public around the importance uh, that the court has in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, uh, their judgment is understood, particularly within the context of our history where we come from. But at the same time, the fact that we are a young democracy, constitutional democracy sometimes can be very complicated. And therefore, you need to, 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 to ensure that we educate our public around uh, the difference between parliamentary democracy and constitutional democracy. Constitutionalism, vis a -vis the confines that you need to operate within uh, as a constitutional democratic state. Thank you, uh, uh, Judge Kuhn. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Honorable Mr. Thank you. I hope I answer your uh, questions fully or as fully as I can. Um, as regards the first one, that is the Cape Bar Council versus the um, Judicial Service Commission. Um, the primary point there, and it wasn't really a novel issue, I think it was based mainly on a, a previous judgment in Ski Road, and then also a judgment in the Cape. Um, uh, I think it was the Democratic Alliance versus the Judicial Service Commission. The facts in that matter had been not too different from those that confronted me, but the member of the, of the Judicial Service Commission that was absent on that occasion was the Premier or the Premier's representative. It was a, a Judicial Service Commission meeting to deal with the appointment of judges in a particular provincial division. In other words, where this um, commission consists not of 23 members, but of 25, the last two being the um, commission, the, the uh, premier of that province, and then the judge president of that province. Now, in that case, the, the uh, premier of the province, for reasons which I cannot recall, wasn't there. Um, but based on that judgment, the one in, I think it was Skiro, if I remember correctly, 1954 judgment dealing with administrative law, and that if you have a body which has to take a decision, then it means a body as properly constituted in terms of the legislation. I came to the conclusion, as subsequently also endorsed by the Supreme Court of Appeal in a unanimous judgment written by uh, Judge Justice Brunt, that the Judicial Service Commission hadn't been properly constituted. And that was the basis for that finding. Um, as regards the second issue, it is a burning issue and it's something that's quite close to, my, close to my heart as well. Um, let me just firstly say that I tend to, to err rather on the side of showing some deference to executive action than being too progressive in possibly pinning a judgment which might encroach on an aspect of the executive which ideally should be left to the executive, if you understand what I say by that. Um, having said that, I write judgments for the loser. That's always been my approach. 
it is important that when I make a finding that the person who has lost must understand why he or she or it lost. The, the victor <laughs> will collect a copy of the judgment, probably never read it, uh, because he or she has the order that, that they want. But it's important to write for the loser, and it's even more important to write in a language not always necessarily reminiscent of of uh, the, the legalese that we so easily use and intersperse with Latin phrases, but rather um, in intelligible language, which a lay person can hopefully also understand. So that one must reduce what might be fairly complex issues of law to as simple terms as you can. Now, it's, I would like to think that I don't um, suffer too much of a problem in that regard because the language in which I write English is my second language. So I, uh, I have an adequate command of it, but I, um, I'm not necessarily privy to, to particularly highfalutin words, which men in the street might not understand. But it's important to emphasize that issue, that judgments must be intelligible. They must be able to be understood by the person that I'm writing for, particularly if in a criminal context. Um, and it's not looking down on accused persons at all, but often they are people with a lower level of education because of circumstances, very unfortunate circumstances at times. And you've got to be able to explain to that person. Now, how do we get the message out there to the public? It's a more difficult issue. I, um, I've never understood why um, some courses at schools um, some that are often scorned as uh, perhaps of less academic value, and I think you're particularly of life orientation. Um, for those who might have children or have recently had children at school, um, that's a subject that's often prescribed. It's mandatory. Um, it doesn't carry points for admission purposes at universities, but it's a general sort of a life orientation, as the name indicates. And I think like with the American example, there's scope for a component to be added to that course on um, familiarizing young children, high school children now, with the Bill of Rights, for example, that they become acutely aware of what their rights are, not only as children in terms of Section 26 and the other sections, but of all the fundamental rights. Um, I think if that is taught and it comes through the, the ages as the population grows older and they have that basic knowledge, then hopefully judgments will also become more intelligible. Um, but, but that's, uh, I think, the only recommendation I can suggest at the moment as I sit here. Uh, thank, thank you, Dasku. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, Honorable Moeman. Um, Commissioner Mad Madolo Zebu. Okay, thank you, Chief Justice. Hey, good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon. I had I heard you earlier speaking about some of the judgment, uh, the make cases that come before you involve the conduct of, of legal practitioners, uh, the conduct of legal practitioners, and their and what I want to 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 find out uh, the Legal Practice Council and the Legal Practice Act. Its main mandate is to protect the public and secondly, to, to improve the standards and uphold the integrity <clears> of the <throat> practitioners. So in your view, I, I, I'm, I'm very curious to, under, uh, to know that what can be done, what, what do you see as a problem of the conduct of legal practitioners, both advocates and, you know, we don't have, it's, it's legal practitioners. Yes. Uh, what do you see as, as that problem that comes before you uh, frequently, and if so, what can be done to to try and keep it? Yes. Thank you. If I may just firstly say, although I refer to dealing with these matters, I don't deal with them that often. Um, it's not as though we have a, a huge influx of that kind of cases in KZN, but when they do arise, I often, uh, I often preside on a full bench or then sometimes even a full court. Um, the, many of them involve 
non or a failure to apply timelessly for the um, audit certificate. Um, there are many young practitioners in KZN um, who I think firstly battle to find articles of clerkship. When they do, upon completion thereof, they have difficulty in finding employment with bigger firms. It's pretty much for a select group. So the next best thing is that many open by force, almost, their own practices. And uh, they might be talented lawyers, but they're not necessarily very talented accountants. And the bookkeeping falls behind, and uh, soon they, they cannot get a clean audit certificate, or they simply omit because of pressures of practice, or whatever the situation might be, to renew the certificate timelessly. Then there's a complaint by the Law Society or the Internal Audit Department, I beg your pardon, Law Society, LPC. The LPC picks that up and uh, they commence proceedings against them. And then you often find an application is brought for their suspension, pending them providing the required audit certificate. Um, and they do so after the application is brought and it's maybe adjourned for a month. They produce that certificate, but now they also face the costs on an attorney and client scale of this application that's been brought. So one leg of it is a, a failure to, or a, a, an inability to adequately appreciate the, the commercial requirements, the accounting requirements of conducting a legal practice. I am not in answering this question, um, including those who have opened a trust account and there is now a huge sum of money coming through in the trust account and being young practitioners, they might be tempted to borrow um, that amount on a Friday afternoon with the expectation of putting it back on the Monday and it's gonna be doubled at the casino or whatever the case may be and it doesn't happen. Those are clear cases of theft of trust monies or fraud or whatever particular um, situation it might be. That, that, that clearly is a more serious situation, um, but I think there you either you're a fit and proper person you have a sense of responsibility, a sense of honesty, and you avoid that kind of conduct or you don't and you're unfit to practice. Um, but even then, um, our inclination is to look at um, serial defaulters on not providing audit certificates that they perhaps be suspended subject to certain conditions, such as for example, that they don't practice for their own account, but nevertheless still practice, but with a, a larger firm where there's an infrastructure in place dealing with accountancy issues, and then hopefully they acquire the skills. That's the only suggestion I can make. I think the LPC um, has improved its act a lot on that, in that, in that regard. They have these, uh, these uh, uh, or some of their personnel going out, doing routine checks and trying to assist wherever they can. But it's, it's generally a problem with young practitioners having just started off and I think not quite appreciating um, fully the extent of what is required by the accounting side of a legal practice. As a follow up, I th I thank you, thank you for that. The reason I'm asking, we are trying to introduce programs of, of trying to assist them to improve their running of practice. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Honorable Dodovo. Uh, thank you very much, uh, CJ. Uh, good afternoon, Justice. Good afternoon, sir. Now that you 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 referred to section 174, that provision of the constitution enjoins this body, the JSC, to look at to consider the racial and gender balance of, of in terms of the composition of this uh, of, of this body. Do you think, in your view? that there could be other considerations that we apply in selecting the candidates. Like for example, looking at the ideological orientation or the class disposition of, of the candidates who appear before, before us. Do you yes. think we must look at, at those as well as considerations yes, for I, our candidates? Yes, I, I, I wouldn't like to 
to fetter your discretion on deciding on an appropriate candidate. 174.1, as you are aware, refers to an appropriately qualified person and then a person who is a fit and proper person to be appointed. Now, I know that um, various organizations, amongst others, uh, the Government Democratic Rights Unit, unit of, the, uh, of the University of Cape Town, which produces the, uh, or some of the comments on judgments that we have submitted, have expressed the view that uh, this is section 174.2 is not just a numbers issue, if I may call it that, or a quota type system. Um, 174.2 in its wording to me appears to differ, for example, from equity legislation and um, legislation that requires that the employment equity, that there are certain number of, be a certain number of a certain racial group. So in other words, it's not a, it's not a, a SARS versus, um, ah, the name of the lady escapes me now, but the policewoman um, situation of she couldn't qualify because the next stage of the promotion, there were already certain numbers of population groups. It's a, it's a, it's a polycentric inquiry. It requires that it broadly reflects um, race, gender are important in, your, in making your decision, but so are appropriately qualified, experience, um, fit and proper person, and considerations such as the work ethic, for example, of the applicant, um, possibly uh, a particular jurisprudential leaning, and that's where I try to combine it with the... I, but personally, I singled out two. I said ideological orientation and class disposition. I want you to speak to the two. I know that there could be others that we look at, but I want those two. If we say, if I, sorry, I don't want to answer a question with a question, but ideological, um, uh, if it's a, as wide an ideology as um, whether one has a libertarian approach to law or a, or a positivist approach to law, then I would think that those are considerations which should be given attention to, assure, to ensure an adequate spread within that particular court of various representative ideologies. Looking at yourself, lastly, uh, 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 Chief Justice, could you classify yourself as a conservative, a progressive, or even a pan-Africanist? Um, yeah, I, I, I would have some difficulty in putting myself in a pigeonhole. I, um, in, in legal terminology and philosophy, I'm probably a more positivist in the sense that I, I look at what the law says by virtue of my training. I'm, I'm rather a positivist looking at what the law means than what the law perhaps should be. Um, uh, having said that, I, I believe there's a, a role for for the judiciary, um, you know, we don't we don't go out and select cases. We deal with cases that come before us. Uh, we're not proactive. We, in a sense, I suppose, reactive in in having to decide what comes before us. We don't control, as is often said, the sword or the purse. We not we not the executive. We not the legislature. So it's quite difficult to for a judge um, to to say that you subscribe to a certain um, philosophy. Um, certainly as a South African judge, I have sworn true to the, to the constitution and I embrace the lifestyle and the society that we have. A multicultural, multiracial um, society where I believe every person should have his place in the sun. Those that have been disadvantaged, there are provisions in the constitution uh, historically disadvantaged, 
that uh, we must be very sensitive to. If I had more time, I would follow up, but it's okay. So uh, yeah, if I, if I haven't answered your no, question, no, okay. please forgive me, but uh, I think that's the best I can do in the... In no, it's the, okay. You accept that you look composed and, and confident, and thanks for that. Uh, thank you. Honorable Singh. Uh, thank you very much, Chief Justice. Chief Justice, I, I just had a follow-up uh, with regard to the uh, issue raised by Commissioner Moimang when he referred to the Cape Bar Council and the JSC and another. Now, I know, Judge, uh, good afternoon, Judge, firstly. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Uh, I know that you did uh, tell us uh, the reason for that kind of judgment and that the uh, appeal was also dismissed in the SCA. But I'm trying to understand your comment there on page seven, where you say, and I want to quote, I granted the order without fear demonstrating my independence and objectivity, and regardless of the consequence that it might possibly not endear me to this commission in the future. Now, for myself, I must say that, uh, you know, there, there will be no prejudice when you've taken the decision based on law and the facts. And uh, I don't think uh, this commission, I can't speak for the commission, but I don't think this commission will consider you in any bad light because you ruled against the JSC at that moment in time. Yes. And perhaps this is the only time that you've, you've appeared before the JSC uh, since 2012. So I'd just like your brief comment on that. Thank yes, you. Mr. Singh, thank you. Um, if, if, it, if what I recorded there suggested um, any sort of uh, uh, malicious possible approach by this commission to punish me for having decided a particular matter against it in 2012, then, then I've overstated it and I apologize. Um, that is certainly not the intention. What happened after that judgment was delivered was that the then spokesman or spokespersons of the JSC were critical very critical, um, perhaps that's putting it too strongly too, were critical of my judgment. Um, sorry, when I say my judgment, I wrote it, but it was concurred in by a, a fellow judge who's in fact now on the Supreme Court of Appeal. Um, I didn't take that personally. I, uh, I welcome situations where um, others might disagree with my judgment and I readily accepted when the application for leave to appeal was argued uh, before me, I granted the application for leave to appeal without reservation to the Supreme Court of Appeal. All I sought to convey was um, some judges might, not saying will, when dealing with a sensitive case like that, possibly have an eye on the future. Um, I've always wanted to be a judge. I was hoping to advance my career as a judge. Um, if it should ever have transpired, and fortunately it hasn't, that uh, it would be said of me that I have previously found against this commission with costs, and therefore um, I would not be fit uh, to be promoted, and I must remain a puny judge. Well, then so be it, unfortunately. I would be very disappointed but I am, um, and that's all I sought to convey. I was prepared to speak out without fear, favor, or prejudice. If it means I remain a puny judge for the rest of my life, um, I've been true to my oath of office and, uh, and I can sleep well at night. Um, that's, that's all I was seeking to convey. Thank you, Judge. And I think that's something we respect as commissioners. Thank you. Your judgment. Uh, thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, thank you, Honorable Singh. Uh, Judge Kuhn, I am last. Um, as you are aware, I caused documentation to be circulated to you <clears throat> so that I can put one or two questions to you. Yes. I'll, I'll summarize what I have to put to you in a form of a statement to avoid a long discussion and afford you the opportunity to comment. During the course of 2016, after a meeting of the heads of the three arms of the state, it became necessary that every arm 
embarks on uh, cost-cutting measures. And part of the documentation that you have finished with encapsulates mm -hmm. measures that the heads of courts, after discussion with the different courts, in other words, after discussion with judges in their divisions, including um, with the magistracy in certain respects, uh, came up with as a contribution towards ensuring that the courts with the limited resources at their command are able to get core business uh, attended to. Now, thereafter, there were comments from different divisions, and the KwaZulu-Natal division is one of those divisions. When I became aware that uh, there were concerns and there were some media inquiries, I caused the statement to be published on the 1st of September 2016, having already undertaken to meet the judges of uh, KZN division the next day. I got there. I had never seen a judge president as terrified as uh, Judge President Japi was. I had never seen a uh, Deputy Judge President Madondo as terrified as I found him to be. He's a man I started cause one with. I didn't understand until I had a meeting with you together with the officials from uh, <clears throat> the administrative arm of the judiciary, the office of the chief justice. Now, I want to focus only on you. There were three of you who spoke in a way that caused grave concern. But maybe just to highlight features of uh, the cost cutting measures. Our proposals, which were never intended to be binding on any judge, but as we indicated in the statement, it was a matter of an appeal to the conscience of a judge, an appeal to a judge's sense of responsibility towards his or her country, where among others, let us move from an S class to an E class, E400. Let us move from a seven series BMW or the equivalent in price to, uh, I think uh, we said five, uh, five uh, 40. Let us uh, not travel with spouses, or if we do, let us not claim subsistence uh, allowance for them. Let us not travel with our secretaries or PAs because they will have to have accommodation and meals paid for them. And they will also have to claim from the lean budget that we already have. And a number of other proposals that are in the documentation that are furnished to, to fellow commissioners as well. I focus only on you, although there were three of you who were leading. Uh, the JP didn't have a say, the DJP didn't have a say, or chose not to have a, a say. There were three of you, and you were one of the leading voices in, 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 in that uh, meeting, which I, 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 I would characterize as one of the most unfortunate meetings judges should ever have. Now, your comments in particular, and I, 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 I'm putting it at the lightest possible level, where the most discourteous comments I've ever heard a judge make to his own colleague. I left the meeting deeply concerned about how Judge President Jappi will ever be able to run a division like that, deeply concerned about how the that, well, let me focus only on you. How you treat the uh, advocates who appear before you. How you treat litigants and witnesses. How you treat members of the public in other ways. I was shocked. I said to myself, how did he become a judge? I remember leaving the meeting, one, of, one member of uh, the executive of the office of the chief justice, who is a, who is a white Afrikaner said to me, Chief Justice, I'm ashamed to be a white man. I said to him, because you don't have to be ashamed. 
you'll come across discourteous people regardless of color. And in any event, the three judges who were leading in this most unprecedented way of communicating their concerns to another judge, two are white and another is not white. Another I think was either colored or Indian. So I, don't, I didn't see it like him as a racial issue. But as I said, it's one of the worst experiences I ever thought judges were capable of in communicating with fellow judges. Now, I, I, I want your, your comment there, if any, because that's the experience I have, and I promise I'll do my best not to engage in any dialogue with you. Yes, thank you, Chief Justice. This matter must be seen in its context with respect. What we had in KZN was that we were initially provided for a meeting which we had in April of 2016 with a document headed resolution. That resolution at the time that we received it prior to that meeting was the first time that we had heard of anything like that. It was raised at our judges meeting on the 16th of April, 2016, if I remember the date correctly. And we were told that it was not yet a resolution that was by the judge president, but that we could make representations in respect thereof. And certain of my colleagues started compiling such representations. I was not involved in that process. At a subsequent stage, we received a circular number 15 of 2016. That circular then recorded that certain cost-cutting measures had already been put in place at a time when my colleagues thought that an opportunity was still being allowed for representations to be made. Anyhow, the circular was received and it became um, a hotly contested or hotly debated issue. The circular involved um, the application of, amongst others, section 176.3 of the, or implicated, I should say, the provisions of section 176.3 of the Constitution, which provides that a judge's salary and other benefits may not be reduced. Concern was expressed by colleagues about the scaled down um, motor vehicles that they would qualify for in the future. They also expressed concern about the accommodation rates, that's the subsistence and travel allowances, which were being reduced insofar as spouses were concerned. It was a matter of some concern because in KZN, we would travel to outlying circuits for periods of at times five to six weeks. And colleagues were expressing much concern that they would be gone for five to six weeks and would not be allowed to be accompanied by spouses or partners. In fact, one particular judge had an experience that when he was absent, his wife who had remained at home was confronted by home invaders, four home invaders. And fortunately, um, she wasn't uh, too badly injured, but she had been confronted. And he had decided that she should accompany him, certainly on future times when he was away. These issues didn't affect me directly. I was not in line to have a replacement vehicle in the foreseeable future. I had in fact one received one 
prior or shortly prior to uh, even the meeting that we had in KZN in April of 2016. Um, I did not have a spouse, do not have a spouse. So when I travel, um, I didn't have the concerns that colleagues had. But this circular became a highly debated issue at our morning teas that we have in the respective centers in both in Durban and in Peter Marisburg. And my recollection is, this is how it goes back five years, so please excuse me, but I have endeavored to read the, well, I have read the documents that you furnished to me, and I've also extracted various emails, which I was able to retrieve, and I've also um, got a transcript of the meeting which you referred to, uh, which you came to, um, to address us in, um, in KZN. Based on that, my recollection is that I was, I think, the senior judge after the judge president in Peter Marisburg at that time. And I was asked to draft a memorandum to obtain clarification on what the position was regarding the judges no longer qualifying for the vehicles or the models as per the judge's handbook, but for those that are now suggested in the circular. During that time, we also, well, I also became aware of a motivation that had been submitted by uh, Judge President Wagley, in which it was made clear from that motivation that this would be a voluntary measure in the sense that um, if a particular judge did not want to accede to the request to um, take a cheaper vehicle or then to not take his wife or spouse or partner um, with them on circuit or any of the other cost-cutting measures that were um, suggested, um, then uh, he didn't have to do so or she didn't have to do so. I prepared a very short memo raising what I considered to be um, the misunderstanding that had arisen. <clears throat> and that is that the resolution of the heads of court suggesting the cost-cutting measures was not one that was violating the provisions of section 176.3 of the constitution and reducing benefits of judges at all. However, there were provisions in the circular that dealt with the implementation of that circular. And amongst others, and I can quote, it said, this was the circular of the 20th of, uh, sorry, 27th of May, 2016. Um, With immediate effect, all hotel bookings, rental vehicles, and travel arrangements for judges should be scaled down in accordance with these resolutions. Bookings confirmed prior to today's date should I ever not be amended. The Judicial Support Unit should note that all vehicles which are currently on order, but not yet delivered and exceeding the amount of 900,000 Rand should be brought to the attention of the Chief Financial Officer. All vehicles for which only quotations have been obtained and no orders have been placed, a new quotation should be requested in line with the 900,000 threshold. Colleagues were seeing or viewing that as new immutable rules, which didn't give them the election to decide, notwithstanding the request for cost cutting, um, to request compliance with what they were entitled to in terms of the judge's handbook. In fact, there were at least two, colleague, two, co two colleagues. Um, the one circulated a, a, an email dated the 17th of August and if I may just place this in historical context, the resolution was the 27th of May. I beg your pardon, not the resolution. The circular was the 27th of May, 2016. Um, this was before the meeting in September. On the 17th of August, this email that she circulated was one received from a Miss Claudine Schubert, Assistant Director, Judicial Support, and it read, the current value for judges' motor vehicles is 900,000. 
you can email your request for a replacement to rmakwane at justice.gov.za. Another circular, well, I beg your pardon, not a circular, an email from one of my other colleagues, who in fact also spoke at that meeting, and I've checked it again last night against the transcript of that meeting. Um, she said as follows, Dear all, I requested a motor vehicle from as early as the beginning of this year, but till today, I'm still waiting. I was misled when Rosemary and company, that's Mrs. R. McQuane, requested a motivation from me and my JP when the price of a motor vehicle I requested was over the 900,000 limit, only by 75,000 Rand. We motivated only to receive a curt response to the effect that if I like the motor vehicle so much, I must pay the 75,000 Rand to G Fleet. I then submitted a quote for a two liter engine BMW X4 in June 2016 to Rosemary, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have to refer to the rest. These colleagues were all of the view that this wasn't just a request to save costs, but was in fact interpreted and was being implied as precluding them from ordering, using the example of the vehicle, a vehicle of more than 900,000 Rand. In other words, precluding them from insisting if they were not disposed to acceding to the cost cutting measures um, to a vehicle that they would otherwise be entitled to in terms of the um, of the, <clears throat> the judges handbook and their and their conditions. It was in that environment that I was asked to write this little memo. I circulated it under cover of an email, which I have with me and important attached to that email was a document which I called KZN business plan, which was in fact a business plan which I had prepared, suggesting other methods of cost containment also in the province of KwaZulu-Natal. They included measures which were in fact subsequently implemented, dealing with reducing the amount of traveling that judges do between Peter Marisburg and Durban, which have resulted in substantial cost savings because the ST subsistence and travel allowances were being reduced. It also consisted of other things. But apart from this business plan which I circulated, I sent this little memo setting out that I believed that the circular which the Secretary General had prepared did not adequately or perhaps accurately record what had been decided by the heads of court. The invitation was that colleagues could add whatever reservations and concerns they had to this memorandum. And a number of colleagues responded. What was initially a short memo soon developed into a, a large document of many pages. I was not involved in that process as further concerns and grounds of complaint or whatever one would like to call it were added to the memorandum. And in fact, the wording was changed. The wording of what appears in the memorandum, which you forwarded to me is not my wording. It's not the style in which I write. My contribution had been minimal dealing initially with this question of the, the, um, the resolution and then the wording of the circular, which purported to record what the resolution was, possibly introducing ambiguity. I had no difficulty with the resolution of the heads of court, and I had no difficulty personally in accepting the cost cutting measures. I had formulated the concerns that colleagues had and that had been added to. That memorandum was eventually collated, not by me, but by another colleague, and it was sent by the judge president to the secretary general and the chief financial officer. And I, if you had to ask me at the time, I would have expected, or I expected that they were going to respond to clarify this issue. We were then told that you would be coming down to address the judges on the 2nd of September, 2016.
During that time, I also received, which I retrieved recently, after receiving your documents, the meetings of the heads of court of the 3rd of April 2016, which were held at the Protea Hotel in Midrand, vetted by Wagley JP. <clears throat> that minute, which now served as the, the true recordal of what was agreed, to my mind, in paragraph 5, recorded the actual resolutions of the heads of court. Paragraph 5.1.3 reflected the cost-cutting measures. It said the heads of court reflected extensively on the proposed cost containment measures and resolved that the measures be applied as follows. And then it deals with the spousal subsistence and traveling allowance, air transport, domestic accommodation, renting of vehicles, traveling with secretaries, use of assessors, motor vehicles for judges, acting judges, and the like. Paragraph 5.1.4 thereof then dealt with the issue of for how long these measures would apply. And it contained a paragraph, contained a sentence, which did not appear in the circular 15 of 2016, but which reaffirmed or confirmed my interpretation of what I understood that resolution to be in the following terms. And I quote verbatim, Quote, where judges do not want to participate in the cost containment measures, they should not be compelled to do it, so sorry, to do so. It should be left to the individual judge's conscience on whether or not to, to support the measures, unquote. That gave me the comfort which I had always had, and the issue to me was purely that the circular, in not recording or referring to that paragraph, had caused confusion amongst colleagues. It was in that context that the meeting proceeded. I should just mention, please, that the press release of the 1st of September 2016, I was not aware of on the morning of the 2nd of September 2016. I think it was referred to at the meeting or shortly before the meeting that there was such a press release, but I only became aware of the contents thereof and at sight thereof after the meeting had already been concluded. As I say, the meeting proceeded. I have a transcript of that meeting, um, which comprises some 38 pages. Um, I've read it, and the contents thereof is consistent with what I have just related to you. I do not want to quote extensively from it, but it's perhaps um, prudent that I do refer to the relevant parts thereof. I spoke second. C CJ. Sorry, sorry, sir. May, may I tell you what my concern is? Sorry, I'm not worried about you commenting. I'm worried about the discourtesy. And others may characterize the way you come across as extremely rude. That is the only issue I'm focusing okay. on. Right. Not the merits or demerits. No, sorry. I'm focusing is somebody speaking? No, no, no. My only focus is as colleagues, we've got to be courteous to one another, however concerned we are. As I said, I won't fault anybody who would say, characterize your communication with me, on which I wanted to afford you the opportunity to comment, as extremely rude, completely unbefitting of a judge, not the merits or demerits. No. But before you comment, just two paragraphs from the statement that judges at that meeting already know the public statement that you say you are not aware of. They raised it at the meeting. Let me just read it, the last paragraphs. These measures are to be departed from only when circumstances so demand. Colleagues were made to appreciate that this is the sacrifice we all have to make for the good of the country, particularly because budgets, including ours, are being cut from time to time. This is a survival strategy. The reversal of these measures is anticipated as soon as our economy recovers from the battering it has hitherto been exposed to. 
This is a difficult country for a difficult period for our country. The sacrifice judicial officers are willing to make for the good of the judiciary and our country is highly appreciated by the collective leadership and membership of the judiciary. We did this alive to the reality that the conditions of employment and benefits of judicial officers are constitutionally protected. If any judicial officer insists on his or her rights, regardless, we will not stand in the way. It is primarily a matter of conscience and one's sense of responsibility. So I don't have a problem with you uh, being opposed to the measures. I'm focusing on collegiality, treating people with respect. That's why I said even litigants, even practitioners appearing from you. I left concern. What kind of, that is the only issue, not the merits. Yes, sorry. My Chief apologies. Justice, uh, Julia is here. Yes, sir. I, I think we have agreed on what is going to be the approach. We still have uh, six candidates to go. Yes. And uh, we've conversed a lot of time with this uh, candidate. So I will request that you find a way of uh, concluding because we're all done with him, yes. except you. Yes. No, that is true. That is my last question. Just uh, comment on whether you were it, it, your, 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 your language, your communication, bordered on rudeness or not. That's all. As briefly as you can. Yes. I, I shall try, Chief Justice. Um, I've read the, the minutes again last night. Um, I respectfully submit that the contents thereof, the relevant part thereof, which I could read out, but which in the interest of brevity now, perhaps I should just paraphrase or, or shorten, um, were not intended to be rude was not intended to be discourteous. Um, perception is however more important. And I, I hear what, what you've said about your concerns. Um, certainly my intention <clears throat> was never to be discourteous or as you've categorized it, rude. If it was construed as such, then I am very saddened by that fact and I apologize unreservedly. I stood nothing to gain by this with respect. The vehicles, the spouses didn't involve me. I have proactively since that time and even before not used assessors. I have not claimed traveling and subsistence. Um, I have no spousal subsistence in traveling that I've claimed. Air transport, accommodation I haven't used. When I go on circuit, I commute. Um, I, I don't want to labor the point because that deals with what I did about cost cutting. Yes. But yes. Yeah. The, the actual wording on pages 14 and 15 of the transcript of that meeting, I introduced yes. myself. I said I was responsible for part of the drafting of the memorandum. And I said, I certainly interpreted the resolution. Chief Justice. I beg your pardon. Chief that no, 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 no. I think the I, point I think, I, through you, Yes, Chief I Justice. think you've addressed the issue, Judge. You've Chief. addressed Thank the you. issue, you have even apologized. So everything else is Thank not you, nice. Thank you. I, I, Thank hope you. The, I hope the apology is accepted, Chief Justice. No, it is accepted, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. You, you, you are excused, Judge Kuhn. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice, and thank you, Commissioners.